Welcome to Western Utah on a stormy day and an area known as Crystal Peak. Um, this place is really intriguing because in an area of Western Utah where the dominant rock types are these layered Paleozoic sedimentary rocks, limestone, shales, and sandstones, that's the dominant rock type we see here in much of um, Western Utah. And different, you know, drab colors, browns, tans, grays. Then you end up with this incredibly stark white, uh, basically a small mountain, maybe up to 400, 500 feet tall, um, that really just seems out of place and um, completely an anomaly in this location. Thanks for joining me today. I'm geology professor Sean Wilsey out in the western part of Utah, exploring some of the great geology here in the basin and range. I think we have two big tasks before us here, team. First off, we need to figure out what kind of rock this is and see if we can put together some clues as to why <clears throat> this mound of white rock exists out here in Western Utah. And then equally intriguing are these large cavities or holes in the rock. The whole thing looks like it's just a chunk of Swiss cheese. So we might wanna spend some time looking at those, seeing if we can figure out what sort of process is responsible for creating the holes in the rock there. But let's start down here um, in this gully, looking at some of the rocks themselves up close. Um, give you a chance to kind of digest it all. So we can see we've got some particles in here. Um, doesn't seem to be any layering at all, but we've got particles uh, up to about, you know, fist size, softball size so far. Might be bigger ones, but we're not seeing any just yet. And then there's smaller particles as well. Uh, much smaller little specks of material. Um, of course, when I see very white rocks like this, with this kind of texture, uh, sometimes in volcanic regions I think about ash. And so that could be one of the things we're looking at here. So we might call this thing, uh, I suppose we might, well, let's make some more observations first. Looks like a lot of the particles kind of angular in terms of their shape. Doesn't seem to be a lot of rounding for the most part. There's one's actually kind of sticking out of the rock, a very angular particle. And as we look at the particles, um, they seem to be mainly made out of the local rock types around here. Those same limestones, maybe some sandstones, quartzites. Uh, looks like that's what we generally see uh, making up a lot of the particles here in this unit. Again, not a lot of layering. Uh, they seem to be kind of haphazardly thrown in here. Um, no respect to uh, sorting of the sizes. There's a big chunk here. Another one over here, but a bunch of small ones mixed in. So it really looks like some sort of process that just dumped all these particles in uh, at the same time without any sort of like um, process that might have organized them in any way, shape, or form. What's intriguing is as I look at some of these small little white specks in here, uh, these look like pumice. They have little holes in them. Um, a lot of these white particles in here look to be volcanic and to me they're looking like pumice. Some of them even have crystals in them. So what I think we have here is uh, a tough, or I guess you could call it in places a, a bit of a breccia because it's got these larger particles in here. But let's go with tough for now, even though it might be more of a tough breccia, at least locally. Um, looks like the large particles are more the anomaly. And with these limestones and sandstones and quartzites embedded in the tuff, that would make these xenoliths. These are foreign rock fragments. These have no business in a volcanic deposit like this ash tuff here. Um, so those are some of the observations I've made um, and maybe you've made as well. So if you look at this on Google Earth, again, it sticks out a bit like a sore thumb. 
uh, in terms of just being out here. So as we have this tough here, we might think about a few different processes that create tufts. Here's a couple more clasts here. Uh, nice little striped one right here. Lots of these particles. Some are loose, but a lot of them are still um, connected in with the rock. So we might think of ash either falling out of the sky, what's known as an ash fall tuff. Um, and then the other type of mechanism where we get ash deposited on a landscape forming a tuff would be an ash flow tuff, a pyroclastic flow moving along the ground. Now, in order to figure out which one we have, I think the big clue that's going to help us differentiate those two are going to be these big foreign rock bodies, these xenoliths, these big chunks of limestone and sandstone and maybe even shale that definitely don't belong anywhere in this deposit. Now, if we had an ash fall tuff, you might have a few of those at the bottom where they're already sitting on the ground, but most of your ash fall would be, um, you just have ash in that section, right? You wouldn't have particles of other rock types in there as, as well. Perhaps as it was, ex as if the volcano was erupting, you might get a few of those, but really here we're just getting such a slurry of these. Um, and so I think the evidence here is suggesting that this is an ash flow tuff, a pyroclastic fall or pyroclastic flow deposit that came down the landscape. Also, if you look at Google Earth and see how, um, how confined this deposit is in this region, that also argues for it maybe being an ash flow tuff versus an ash uh, fall tuff where it might have blanketed the landscape. We don't really see a whole lot of this unit in a lot of other places. And so luckily, uh, some good folks have worked on this over the years and have put together uh, a nice little sequencer model that we can go through here that basically uh, tells us the sequence sequence of events that led to the formation of Crystal Peak. So this is from a uh, the Utah Geological Survey. They have a publication called Survey Notes. This is from the December 2019 one. So let's start our story with a valley, uh, a paleo paleo topography, just some sort of valley on the landscape, cut into these sedimentary units, these Paleozoic sedimentary units. The main ones here is an Ordovician unit known as the Poganip group. Again, it's mostly limestones, some shales and sandstones. Then we have an eruption. The age of this eruption of ash is about 33 million years ago. So some, some vent nearby erupted um, and produced pyroclastic flows that filled this valley uh, up to several hundred feet. And this is common when we see pyroclastic flows, they tend to be, uh, they tend to move down valleys preferentially, and they tend to be much thicker in those valleys as well. So there's our tough filling in the valley, okay? In our next sequence, if we go forward into maybe about 17 million years ago, this would be during basin and range extension. So now we've got a fault that's pushed one block of this ancient valley downward and pushed one side upward. So we've actually pushed one side up, elevated this region. Okay, and if we go to our next little diagram here, we can see the fault here in the subsurface. This other, this downdrop block of the fault is being buried by erosion. And because this, this pyroclastic material, this silica rich, quartz rich ash is harder than the, rock, the sedimentary rocks surrounding it, it preferentially is going to resist erosion. And over time, it's going to create a high point, a, high, um, a topographic high point here. So what we have here is this is actually kind of a cool story because what started out as a low area, this valley that filled with ash to form the tuff, eventually became the high point, Crystal Peak, the big mountain that we're looking at above us here. So this is a case of what we call inverted topography. What was once low, the valley, is now high because it's been filled in with the, the tuff. And what was once higher, um, the sides of the canyon here in this case, is now low and it's been eroded away. So again, inverted topography, uh, pretty remarkable. So let's, um, 
now that we've figured out the origin of Crystal Peak in terms of how these rocks were emplaced, uh, let's go ahead and head up to some of these big Swiss cheese holes and see if we can make heads or tails of those. Okay, so I've moved up a little closer to the peak and found a nice little section here of these big holes in the rock. Uh, you can see more of them pretty much going all the way up to the summit there. They're just kind of everywhere. And so let's see again, like we did before, let's start with a few observations. Um, boy, some of these are big enough I can crawl into them. You might see right off the bat though, before we get a little bit closer, that in general, they look like they're wider left to right than they are tall. So they more or less, um, there's some consistency in terms of how tall they are up and down, but laterally, some of them are, are pretty extensive. One down here that's a little more spherical. Um, I thought maybe a good hypothesis might be that it has something to do with these xenoliths, but in looking at these, it looks like there's really no rhyme or reason as we kind of look into one here. The dark xenoliths, the limestone and other sedimentary rock fragments here, look just as scattered um, and random as any other place we've seen in this tuff. And so remember these particles, these xenoliths, were all just blown out during the eruption, this big explosive eruption, and they were all carried with the ash and the pyroclastic flow deposits uh, as they came down the valley. Let's see what else we can see here. This one actually has a little tunnel down through here. Um, one other thing I've noticed is this, this rock, even though it's resisting erosion because it has quartz crystals in it and other hard materials, it's actually somewhat soft and porous and permeable. You can see how easily it can be scratched right here. So it's not welded together very strongly. It's not a very competent, compact, a cohesive unit, somewhat soft. Uh, as a rock climber, I'd be terrified to climb on this stuff because it's it looks very friable. Looks like it would break off pretty easily. Not sure I'd want to like trust trust this rock if I had to hang off of it. And so I've actually seen this kind of weathering phenomena before. It's actually an Italian word, and it's called. Tafoni or Tafani, not sure how it's pronounced, uh, T-A-F-O-N-I. And these big holes then, you typically see this type of weathering in locations near the ocean, sometimes in granite or sandstone, um, or else in a desert region where there's a lot of salt. Now we are in part of the region where the Great Salt Lake desert existed but at this elevation um, even Lake Bonneville didn't reach this high at this elevation here so even though we're near like the Bonneville salt flats uh, the prevailing winds just don't bring a lot of that that salt off the the lake bed into this region so there has to be something else that's pr producing this but similar and in coastal settings what happens is the seawater with the salt in it ends up uh, getting sprayed on the rock and as the water evaporates the salt crystallizes and the crystallization of salt actually produces sufficient pressure that it actually splits the rock apart and starts this process of creating the holes like you see here so we need something other than salt to produce similar effects and it turns out that the, the material that needs to, that would crystallize to form this type of weathering is not salt, but actually calcite. So the calcite is a huge ingredient in all these gray and dark colored xenoliths, the limestones especially, maybe some of the, sh the shales in here as well. All of these chunks from the Poganip group are made either exclusively out of calcite or they have quite a bit of calcite in them. 
So as the water, as groundwater and rainwater move through the rocks of Crystal Peak, rainwater, as it goes through the atmosphere, picks up a little bit of CO2. And when it hits the ground, it's actually a weak acid, a carbonic acid. So it has a little bit of an acidic chemistry to it. And as that acidic water moves through this porous and permeable rock, riddled with these calcite-rich xenoliths, it actually um, dissolves some of the calcite out of those xenoliths, carries that calcite-rich material into the rock, out to the face, where it ultimately water evaporates and the calcite crystallizes, and that's what forms some of these holes. As the calcite crystallizes, it breaks apart sections of the rock. And so that's the the story, the uh, process that's produced all these crazy holes in Crystal Peak, this Tafoni or Tafani, um, the Italian word that I need to know how to pronounce. So pretty remarkable. The other thing you can see here from this aerial view is there's definitely some sets of fractures running through this tough unit in different places. So as this thing came to rest, um, it looks like there's some consistency with these fractures that have formed in it. So pretty remarkable, but just a nice view here of the stark white tuff of Crystal Peak in contrast with the more earth tones of the sedimentary units here out in Utah's West Desert in the Basin and Range. Pretty remarkable and fantastic. Um, first time here. I'm pretty impressed. This is pretty awesome here. And that's a lot of tough. So that is a lot of ash that came down the valley. And from the research and reading I did, this is, um, there's a little bit more of this tough in places, but this is by far the location that has the thickest uh, and largest volume that's left of this deposit. So uh, a little, a little remnant, a little, um, I guess, uh, evidence left behind from this eruption 33 million years ago here at Crystal Peak. Hope you can come out here sometime if you're in the region, check it out on your own. Thanks for joining me again uh, on this nice little adventure. Appreciate you watching and educating and learning with me and have a good one.